Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I'm very pleased to have my friend, I think I've known you about 15 or 18 years, Lewis Gersh of Pebble Post. How are you doing today, Lewis? Great, Nathan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, this is fun. I'm excited to have you here. So I helped Lewis write, I think, your first PPM, private placement memorandum, when you were raising a venture fund many, many years ago. And now here you are as a founder. We're going to get into that, but it's, I'm excited to have you here. Let's just start off with the, the most basic question. What is Pebble Post? What do you guys do? So we invented what we call programmatic direct mail. And what we can do is transform up to 70% of website activity into a dynamically render and personalized piece of physical direct mail, zip sorted into a postal hub in under 24 hours, fully automated every day. So we can take the website activity and turn it into uh, actual mail to home where people make decisions. So uh, I think I understand it. So I'm browsing um, LL Bean or J Crew or something. I'm looking at a certain flannel shirt. You're sending me a postcard three days later, reminding me of this or offering me a discount. Is that the, the crux of it? Gen uh, generally, yeah. So essentially, uh, let's use box.com, who we work with quite a bit. Um, you're on box.com browsing, searching. We can uh, define if you're a customer or, or a new to file prospect on the website, bucket you into the appropriate campaign, run the filters for any geo-targeting or other attributes around it, and then dynamically render the appropriate piece of either postcard, catalog, or multifold. Um, and that is then zip sorted into a postal hub in under 24 hours, fully automated. Um, so it does arrive home in about three to five days with first class postage. And how are you connecting my browsing activity to my home address? So uh, we do that through, we have three uh, methodologies that we use and we don't use any names of anybody as PII unless they're an existing customer. So uh, the first level is we look at the CRM data of the brand, right? Do they recognize by device, cookie, browser, et cetera, who that return, that visitor is to the website? Okay. That also helps us partition uh, customers versus prospects, right? Uh, if it's a known customer. The second level, we have uh, our address graph, which uh, is about 350 uh, e-commerce uh, sites, brands, are now in that as a quote unquote co-op, where every day we look at do, where they recognize an individual at the site from their own CRM data. And we, uh, we uh, establish an ID for Pebble Post on that device and browser, uh, put a Pebble Post cookie there. And then if we see that person on another brand site uh, where they want to retarget them off that site visit, we're able to know who they are. Uh, in that shared co-op, just for getting an address to a home. Again, not with names, no, we drop out almost all the PII. Think of it as an, a, a household registry of the United States that we're building, connecting to device and browsers, regardless of the individual. And then the third, we use third-party data sources um, that help us enhance how many we can match and where they are, and we run them all together. And that's where we come up with a number of up to 70% of site activity that we can match to an address. Interesting. Uh, um, that's pretty cool. Um, and where are you seeing most activity? Is this e-commerce, fashion, retail, or is this, you know, you mentioned box.com. I wouldn't have guessed that would be a, a target customer, but like, you know, what, what are some use cases of where this is really applying and fitting? Yeah, um, there's actually a really cool use case with box.com. But uh, so it is mostly, we started with e-commerce. Um, we started with, call it uh, digitally native uh, brands, right? Uh, because anybody coming back to that site, we have a much better chance of seeing them on a website by cookie device or browser. And if they convert, we have a name and address because it's a card not present transaction, right? You have to put in a name and address for your billing, your shipping, et cetera. Um, so we can match it to our mail file. We do work with a lot of brands that have physical retail, 
Um, there, when people show up, it's, it's harder and trickier to be able to track them. If they use a coupon code or barcode scan, we can. Um, but back to your question, we, we work across home furnishings, home security, mattress companies, um, uh, so many different types. We're also testing now into education, telco, financial services, et cetera, um, that we have. Yeah, cool. Um, great. And your customers are mainly the brands directly or ad agencies or some combination, like who's, who's paying you? And actually, how's the, the pricing model work? So uh, we work uh, almost entirely brand direct, not through agencies. This is, we, we, as the brands have told us, we invented a new channel right? Much like there was search or social, there's now programmatic direct mail. We sell to digital buyers. Um, they tend to be innovative and want to get an edge against other brands for what they do. They also understand that 90% of the interest and intent data for their customer base or prospects is online somewhere, usually a lot at their brand site. 90% of the decisions generally happen around home, and then 90% of purchases actually happen in the physical world, but we can grab 100% because we can go online or offline from a physical piece of direct mail to drive that, driving that decision of purchase. So we work broadly across them, and what we did is a uh, all-inclusive pricing. It's basically a no-brainer for a brand. It's cost per piece based on monthly volume, no minimum, no term, no setup fee. Obviously, we have qualifications of a good brand to work with versus not a good brand. We're not just taking everybody and anybody who walks up, um, and, and some work better than others, but we try to keep it as low risk and no-brainer as possible. We're averaging something like uh, 8% of all mail sent results in a purchase uh, on the return, and about a 15x return on ad spend. Yeah, interesting. What, is there a minimum? I, you mentioned you don't really work with anyone. Would startups listening to this be relevant customers or not so much? Too small? To work well on the, the platform we have today really needs a good fifty to 100,000 unique users a month. Um, so that kind of sets a minimum threshold. Um, there's also a minimum amount of budget that they need to be spending somewhere, you know, twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a month. Or it's not really worth moving all the, the resources to get it done. Over time, we'll be establishing a self-managed and eventually self-serve part of our platform that can take SMBs and local businesses, all kinds of things. Mm. That sounds cool. Let me know when that's available. We'd love to. One of the things we do in Founder Suite every year, it's like a New Year's resolution, is three of us on the marketing team each have to come up with a new experiment to try. That's just, and we have to bring it to the table, no parameters other than come with a new experiment, marketing experiment to try. So this year I'm kind of thinking of some stuff to do, but uh, yeah, your self-service platform sounds cool. So let me know when that launches. Um, cool. Very good. And so Genesis story, where did this idea come from? You, I know what you're doing before you weren't in, in, <laughs> in the post office. You weren't working as, as a postal delivery man. Um, where did this come from? No, we knew shockingly little about actually the USPS and mail transit. There's some funny stories in there. Uh, but what happened was, uh, as you know, because you helped me work on the founding of my venture fund, I had been an entrepreneur and founded a joint venture with AOL and Omnicom in the 90s. And we pioneered a lot of what became retargeting and behavioral targeting. Um, we used email uh, because it was a, a stable way to serve content and ads back then. It was like mid 90s, right? Ad servers were, were not so reliable. Um, and after I sold the company, I founded a venture fund, leveraging a lot of those principles. Um, and it built a large portfolio that included um, Fetchback, Chango, Tap Ad, Sale Through, Movable Link, Mass Relevance, iSocket, Think Near, Nearby Systems, et cetera, et cetera, 33 across, Rubicon, a whole bunch in it. Um, and did well, really had fun. It, what happened was seeing the advent of programmatic sweeping through, and this is probably seven years ago, um, nobody was really sure what it meant, maybe just automation and the term's been misused and, and reused different ways. But saw it sweeping through display to email and everybody said online videos next. And then maybe it would go in home through IPTV and then digital outdoor, digital radio, maybe uh, events and kiosks too. 
And I thought, okay, a lot of that's just workflow management automation, but how can you really, and what, what I tried to do with my portfolio is work on a mission of what, what do we think programmatic should really mean? And what we came up with was um, data-driven decisioning with high levels of automation that continuously enhance the efficiency and efficacy of the marketer's goal. So if you have that complete loop where you're keeping efficiency and efficacy in balance, you've got something that gets smarter and better, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, as opposed to just automation that is gonna churn out just more at, as workflow. Um, and, and we applied that through the portfolio and it was night and day. The ones who were doing that were succeeding far better than the ones who were really just automation, right? Okay. So, yeah, so I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, display to email to video to IPTV and digital radio and digital outdoor, everybody forgot about direct mail. And I'd been mentored by a direct mail guy earlier in my career. And I thought, well, how could you do that? But if you could own programmatic for a whole channel, that would be really big, right? You could really do some cool stuff with that. Um, and it, story as it goes, I was up in my, uh, as you might know, I have a farm upstate New York and I was on the tractor cutting a field and <laughs> suddenly dawned on me, a friend of mine, our co-founder was working on founding what he wanted was MailChimp for direct mail as workflow automation. And I was thinking about owning programmatic from a whole place and what it could you do with direct mail. And it suddenly, you know, hit me that, well, if you did retargeting with direct mail off brand sites, you'd accumulate a lot of data. Um, it would probably work exceptionally well going from the online intent data, which is so rich into home, which is where people make decisions. And then from home, you can go to any purchase channel. And that's not really what happens with digital digital. You have, the great intent data, but it's really not good for driving decisions at home. And it's really not good for driving people to physical location, which is where 90% of consumer spend happens. Mm -hmm. So I started noodling that around and out of it gave birth to eventually programmatic direct mail and pebble post. It's, and it's one of these ideas. And one of the things I've noticed as a pattern on this show actually is some of the coolest ideas sort of in hindsight are very, pretty simple and pretty like almost intuitive, right? It, you know, the thinking of, of uh, direct mail following a website visit to something you're interested in just seems almost obvious, <laughs> right? It's kind of one of these things like, why hasn't this already been done? And, you know, I, I think the other interesting part from my perspective, I remember when you told me about this years ago, you know, I still check my physical mail every day and there's five pieces of mail in there that I look at, right? Whereas my online browsing, my email box is just overloaded. I can't even keep up with 10% of it, right? So it's like right. the attention I look at my mail, and that's usually not much in it, is actually pretty high, right? So I think that's kind of a cool angle to this whole deal. <laughs> it, was, it was, for most people, it was very intuitive. Um, and they would say, my God, how did nobody think about this? Why hasn't this been done yet? Um, and, and the biggest question was really, ultimately, would the consumer find it useful or would they find it um, abusive of following them around and showing up at home? And the truth is we've had almost no complaints. Um, usually there's been a couple, but it's where somebody else actually overmailed the person and it wasn't us um, at all. What we've seen a lot on social media, it, believe it or not, people posting thank yous and kudos to the brand saying how cool I went to their site, I browsed some stuff and this showed up at home a few days later. That's so cool. One woman posted a video about how cool she loved the piece of programmatic direct mail. Um, and the, and the, the, the fact is when we look at the performance, right, we're off the charts on what a typical marketing channel does. So there, there's kind of pr intrinsic proof in that if it wasn't really helpful, useful, and respectful for the consumer and the household, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be performing, right? Are you facing though, I mean, there is just in the past year, there's been a lot of privacy issues, Cambridge Analytics, you know, GPDR, all this stuff. It seems like in a kind of a upwelling of, of privacy awareness and concern. Is that something that 
worries you or something you've got to kind of? No, it, it actually works very well for us. Um, the abuses are in third party cookie matching and exchange based buying and targeting, right? People go look at something and then somebody else is buying that data and that cookie to retarget them. Um, where there's no, call it privity of the relationship, there's no one-to-one -one contact uh, as a predecessor. With us, we very specifically do brand site retargeting. We will go into publishers as well, but it's only direct with the brands and the site visit to the brand. So the consumer initiated a dialogue with the brand on a one-to-one -one basis, evidenced what we called user-driven segmentation, and then we as a service only for that brand can use that to allow the brand to continue the dialogue back with the consumer in a respectful one-to-one -one way at home. And a piece of paper is not invading your device. And there's no name associated with it unless you're an existing customer. So we've targeted things much more by household where it's, it's really trusting that it's relevant and respectful. And if you're relevant and respectful, it'll work. If you're, Think about relevant and respectful to your digital advertising relationships. Mm -hmm. Most of, you know, you look at a pair of socks, you need a restraining order for six weeks, right? From the digital bombardment. That's, it might be relevant, but it's not respectful. Yeah. I, I last week I went skiing Wednesday and Thursday and on Friday I logged on to Facebook and there was an ad for uh, some app that teaches you or coaches you how to ski. Like I was actually blown away by the relevancy of it and pretty intrigued too. You know, it's kind of, kind of cool in a way when you're getting that, that relevancy targeted at you a little creepy too. Cause I didn't post that I went skiing, right. It just knew somehow I was up at North star, but um, interesting. Is there any way for people to opt out if they don't want to receive? The yeah, so, or, no? yeah. We're, we're, whether it's postcard catalog, multifold, we're a first party service to the brand. So the brand controls their opt in and opt out at their brand level. Uh, so if you say you don't want to receive direct mail or marketing from brand X and we engage brand X, they upload their do not contact file on our system and we, we opt you out, but it's not with us as programmatic direct mail. It's with the brand for their marketing. Yeah. Cause again, we don't do third party cookie buying, matching and, and targeting that way. Let's talk about fundraising. So how much have you guys raised over how many rounds? Um, so in equity, we've raised about uh, 53, 54 million smackers. Uh, and we also have a credit line and a bit of a term note um, too. So it's, I think it's 15 million or so on the credit line. I think it's about 10 on the term note. So I guess all in we're approaching high 70s to 80 million. Over what period of time? When did you start this? Uh, the first fundraise was about four years ago. Okay. Got it. A little over. Yeah. Before we get, I want to go into each round and talk a little bit about each, but let's start off just for anyone not familiar. What is a term note? What does that mean? So that's debt. It's a, it's a note that goes on your balance sheet um, and you owe that back first when you have an exit. So um, a lot of entrepreneurs, um, and now having been on both sides of the table, as you know, founding a fund and founding companies, um, there was, it was kind of became in vogue again for entrepreneurs to arrogantly raise money and go for big term notes saying, oh, we'll save the equity. Um, the problem is you can't raise big equity behind a really big term note. So uh, entrepreneurs that over raise on a term note, um, it better be they they better really hit the ball out of the park or they are uh backing themselves into a very small corner right mm, okay. um so what i always looked at was a calibration of uh something like 10 to 20 percent of the capital you raised as a note um 20 is probably the high end 10 percent is preferable mm. um you're good if you do that you, you know, you're probably in a relatively safe place until you really get the venture proven up big. Um, so we did a seed round, an A round with no note. We did a note with after the B round, only when we had proven a lot of growth and what we were hitting with. And then we, uh, we then refinanced it in the Series C. The primary amount that, of what we've raised is the venture capital. It's the yeah. equity capital. 
And that's what really is fueling the growth that we've experienced. And is the we argument think, for doing the note or, or you know, 20% debt, so to speak, on your fundraising just to preserve some equity and, you know, kind of uh, a little extra leverage? Yeah, it, it basically is. But that's why you want to keep it. I mean, we, keeping it at, at something like, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the capital you raise, um, then it's really just like a, an additional buffer. Broadly, we would, you know, you could think about it as the equity capital is what's covering uh, the burn, right? Keeping things going. Mm-hmm. The a credit line, right? Revolver, which we also have, is basically like covering the DSO, right? The the bill, the uh, the AR that you got to do versus the AP, um, and then the term note is really for us about helping to cover the uh, the fixed costs that we incur with our product, mainly being printing and postage. Mm, so okay. not having to use equity capital um, to pay for that uh, is a great reason to have a bit of a term note. And if it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't have raised much of any anyway. And how about, do you have a, a kind of a benchmark for folks on the credit line? I mean, do you have sort of a, it's a revolving thing, but do you have like a percent of your capital structure that you sort of target? Because I think it's interesting to have these benchmarks. Yeah, um, I've looked at that always as more like that could be 20, a, a line could be up to 20 to 30 percent of what you've raised. Um, the truth is you can only really utilize as much as you're generating in accounts receivable um, on it. So you could raise a $50 million line of credit and you'd be paying for all that access. But if you're only billing $3 million a month and you're on a 60-day collection cycle, you really only need like six or seven million. What's the point, you know? Yeah, gotcha. All right. Um, let's start off with actually seed round. Maybe go back go back four years ago or so. Um, who'd you raise from and what were you pitching at the time? Was it just this idea and your handsome face? And give us a little color yeah. on it. Well, I didn't have the beard. My kids made me keep this on after the holidays and no shaving. They said it made me look like Santa Claus and elderly. Um, you look so, rugged. You look rugged. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so what, we, what happened uh, for the seed round, <clears throat> I'd been, we'd been working up the idea myself and two co-founders. Um, and I, had the, I was the one, the, the founder with the capital experience. Um, so I was able to go out to a number of parties that I had worked with and some where I had brought in deals where I led the deal and they had done extremely well. So you kind of figure no matter what, you know, you should get uh, a respectful time of day out of these people, right. To be able to do it, to raise around, but you don't expect a quid pro quo, right? Nobody's going to invest just because you, you, I mean, some entrepreneurs, you can go back to the same fund and they'll kind of guarantee you a funding um, it's getting a little more rare um, these days. So what we looked at, the issues were really um, nobody had ever really raised venture, early stage venture for a direct mail venture ever. Not one. Um, no, so no successful exits, right? Ad tech was also eh, a little squirrely going up and down at the time, right? And what was happening and worse, uh, Restoration Hardware had mailed those giant uh, phone book catalogs that made people really think about junk mail and hate it. Yeah. <clears throat> and the USPS was rumored to be going bankrupt from the, the pension funds and stuff. And they, somebody had started a rumor they might privatize to, I think it was Staples or something. Um, so that, those were some serious headwinds because we have to rely on the rails of the USPS to get our programmatic direct mail delivered. Yeah. So, I focused, with that being said, identifying what your headwinds are. There are things every entrepreneur will have if they're honest with themselves and their venture. Macroeconomic, geopolitical, incumbents in the space, um, risk going on at that point in time for that sector. Identify them. And then you have to build a story that not only just makes uh, good defensive material about that. Um, I, I chose not to try and defend those issues. Mm -hmm. Um, more about how can this be so big that those are worth the risk, right? So coming up with a a very simple, um, catchy uh, kind of phrase, I think is critical. So the opening for our pitch 
was I have a seven syllable pitch for a billion dollar opportunity. <laughs> and everybody says, well, what's that, right? And I say programmatic direct mail. And night and day, some people would just barf immediately, right? <laughs> um, one of my buddies' venture funds, one of the largest in the space, who shall remain nameless, the main partner said, great, just what the world needs, automated junk mail, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, that's, you can pretty, imagine. Yeah, that, that's pretty good though. Actually, I'll give him a little credit on that. It's <laughs> yeah, not, not the same seven syllables or however many I was thinking of, but, uh -huh. um, uh, and even with my relationships, you know, kick to the curb left and right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it really took, um, finding, and also you want to find the right investor who's going to be really a strong believer, be supportive, have good chemistry, um, and, and things like that. So um, I didn't go around to as many as probably the average entrepreneur because I had a lot of relationships and I was able to just casually ping people or chat with them and get a read. Are they really interested or not? Um, but we did a pretty standard of about 1.5 million seed round, um, which at the time was about the standard size. Uh, today, they're probably a working prototype at that point, or more concept headwinds and how to, you know, kind of the the big vision here. Concept: We had uh, the uh, our two co-founders were starting to plan the architecture, the map, doing some bit of coding to get some stuff set up. Um, but that was a bit of a hurdle. There really wasn't uh, even close to an alpha yet. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest things to deal with because you needed somebody to really envision what this could be. Mm -hmm. And again, it's in, in a place of direct mail where it's been battered as junk mail um, and, and not terribly exciting for a lot of the investment community. Um, regardless of the fact it's the largest ad spend next to TV, the highest response rate of any media you can buy, mm -hmm. has had no new product in 25 years, and is a fragmented ecosystem at 3,000 point solutions that don't talk to each other. By the way, that was my exact talk track when I'd get mm -hmm. them on the phone. Those four things, like that's a dream of an area to disrupt for an average early stage VC. Sure, right? yeah. So that was led by FFVC and Tribeca, do I have that right? Yeah, FFVC led the seed. Uh, Tribeca uh, did a uh, convertible note into the A. Um, so FFVC, we had worked together on Indiegogo and a number of other deals. Um, and including around the transaction processing, um, e-commerce, and ad tech space. So they had experience with all three. Um, they are, one of the things I've always loved is they are uh, not afraid to take a contrarian bet, which they tend to have outsized returns when they're right. Um, and so it, it really seemed like there was a good understanding of what we're onto could be huge. And look, if the worst case scenario is, if our idea wasn't right, we're going to build the first and best workflow automation system for direct mail that's pretty valuable in and of itself, right? That's just the backbone of what we had to do. Um, and everything else is then gravy on top. Um, so we did the seed round with FF and then did a convertible note with Tribeca Ventures. Tribeca Ventures had a theme or thesis around uh, channels for programmatic. Mm. They were very interested in where programmatic uh, principles could be applied. They were in AppNexus among a number of others. Um, that could break open new ways of inventory for marketing services, uh, for buying, selling, targeting, managing, et cetera. Um, so we fit quite well. And that was just, a, they heard about what we were doing. The, one of the partners, I'm old friends with, with both of the partners. One of them reached out and said, heard what you're doing is pretty cool. You know, we have this thesis around channels for programmatic. Love to hear about it. We had a chat, uh, met with the other partner and, the next day, they said, what do you think about, let's do a convertible note to your A. So we didn't actually have to go out and raise. Um, it just kind of happened out of a, a natural relationship, which is also a great way to do it. I, I like to say, and for the entrepreneurs who uh, might be watching this, you're never really raising money. You're just always doing investor development. Mm -hmm. You want to continue to develop relationships, give them visibility, get them excited, um, and so that at the time you're ready to, or think you want, or if you need more capital, 
there's a whole bunch warmed up. Um, some entrepreneurs uh, don't like to do that. Um, and, and the main reason is they worry about divulging information uh, along the way, which then if you miss goals or you have something happen, it can be used against you. You know what? Your performance is going to be your performance on the day that you're going into a round, regardless of whatever you told somebody. And either they believe it's a big market and a big idea and you can continue to go execute against it, or you haven't been and you won't, right? It's, to me, it's, it's greased the skids a lot more um, and, and was very successful for us. Yeah. So for, for your A and your B, did you, did you run a process for those or was it more just this sort of organic investor development, keeping folks updated and it kind of flowed into a, a term sheet? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it almost was a little, little more of the latter. Um, so uh, the A round was with Graycroft. Um, I was out at CES two years ago, uh, right now this week, and uh, caught up with one of the partners there just to grab casual just drinks and catch up. How's the new venture going? What's going on with their fund? We had a lot of co-investments together, myself with their partners as well as with the funds, um, some of their partners at different funds. Anyway, um, so we just caught up for a drink and by the end of it, you know, it was like, you guys really are the best fund uh, for where we are right now. And you really should lead an A round. And they came to the same conclusion. Did it was just a Jedi uh, little Jedi mind trick uh, motion there as you were saying that. <laughs> um, it, you know, when it's true, it's okay to say it, right? If you're <laughs> doing it to try and promote to somebody, it's not going to work. Um, and it really was the truth at that point for them and with us. And when we went to the B round, what happened too was we, we grew uh, a bit too quickly um, after the B. So we, we got through the A, we went, um, I think that was our first year in beta. Um, and we were just starting, yeah, they, we did the A right as we were coming out of beta. Um, and then it was about a year later, and we, we had uh, prepped uh, a whole bunch that we wanted to go uh, live with. And we knew if it took off, we were going to need a good bit more capital to really support the growth. Um, and in the prior two quarters, we had released that address graph so we could do the prospecting off the sites. Mm. Um, that's much more important to marketers. And we basically hockey sticked for about two quarters, like straight up. It was incredible. We joked about it and put a hockey stick on one of our board slides at one point. <laughs> um, not, not that it's hubris. It was just, you know, it's not going to last. So enjoy it while you got it. Right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we came out of that and started talking to RRE, their background with, um, with, uh, James Robinson having run Amex and knowing the financial and transaction processing space, which is a lot of the data we wanted to use, plus they know a lot around MarTech and ad tech. We really felt like they would be the, the best candidate. We had four uh, funds going towards term sheets um, and just got to a verbal with the partners at RRE uh, and said, look, we'll, we'll stop the process with the others if we get to a handshake right now on the phone, I go back with all of them many years. So, you know, we have a lot of trust to be able to do that. Mm. Nice. Um, Good. Yeah. And how about series C, which is fairly recent, right? That's uh, advanced ventures and capital one. The yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a, a handful. It was our, all our existing funds um, that still have reserves capital <clears throat> and then a uh, handful new. So, Advanced Venture Partners, which is the venture arm for Advanced Publications Group, which is the new house family, the billionaire family's um, a group that owns Condé Nast and Charter and all those uh, assets. So we, we, again, for this one, we did a bit of a process. We had gotten through uh, a lot of our learnings and building, and we're heading into build our kind of next gen platform off of all the learnings. So we, we had the, the beta kind of almost MVP into with stuff kind of 
put added on to it. Yep. And we were getting ready to want to build the, the next gen platform that could really be a public company scale type platform and really take this. Like we, we had validated demand in the market for what we're doing. Marketers love this story. Product is performing. Um, we needed to build out the team and we wanted to build out a real data science order automated type platform um, as the next gen. Um, so we started our Series C to really help work on that. Um, and we chose Advanced because we see a large fit also with the publisher market uh, down the road. All those, um, the people visiting uh, publisher sites, evidencing interest and intent could be very useful for targeting and retargeting by that publisher and or for the brands that market on those publishers, right? That buy the ads. Yeah. So, um, so we went through, uh, for this, we did a bit of a process. By the time you get to Series C and a bunch of uh, some of our investors and others were chiding me, I really didn't use a pitch deck for almost any of these rounds. Uh, it was more a discussion and partially because I knew a lot of those people. Um, but I, I, I really believed from the early days of not just it's a seven syllable pitch for a billion dollar opportunity, um, but then at the B round, I would come in with a sample pack of the postcards, drop them on the table and say, see that right there? It's got more revenue potential than AdWords. Can I mm -hmm. walk you through it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like I'm some kid who doesn't know what he's doing at a tech stars, right? It would grab their attention and create a bit of a fun intro for it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's go old school. Let's have a discussion. Let's look at each other in the eye, right? I'll get you a deck, which is as a leave behind, because I know you need to send it to your partners and I know you need a tool to reference, but it doesn't have to command the meeting, right? Sure. And, but at the Series C, we did do a deck because there's so much that we needed to cover. Um, and we did go through a process and the Series C in total was 31 million. Mm -hmm. um, for us. So the vast majority of the capital has been recently, um, or the majority of the capital, not vast, um, has been off this one round. And it was AVP as a lead, Capital One Growth Ventures, um, one of the smartest direct marketers, direct mailers uh, in the country, if not the world, and one of the largest, um, as well as a handful of other new investors that have expertise in the space of data, uh, et cetera, and the existing funds. Very cool. When So let's just touch on a few things you mentioned there. You did do a deck for Series C. I like the showmanship uh, of your other rounds. You know, I think that's actually kind of fun. And I always tell founders, you got to be memorable, right? Because these guys and gals are seeing a lot of deals. And if you don't stand out as something they want to follow up on. So totally. Like yeah. Um, maybe just touch on this for a minute. When you're going after Series C, most of the founders on this show I've had so far aren't that far along their seed series a what's the dynamic of that is it just about your metrics and really getting into data um you know what'd you put in this deck i guess it's maybe the other For the deck. series c series c yeah. c yeah 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 um yeah it's much more it's evolved to um it's really growth funding uh, more than venture funding um and i would say probably the biggest change over the last three to five years is um, companies obviously have been able to accomplish more, a lot more quickly and with less capital, right? We've seen that since the Lehman year, right? The advent of open source, cloud computing, um, apps, all kinds of things. You can get so much more done quickly on less that the demands of each higher, higher uh, letter round, each bigger round, um, get more and more right? Mm -hmm. It used to be a Series C was real venture, still uh, just burning a ton of money, figuring it out. It may take off, it may not. Now they want that done in the B round, right? So the Series C is also much more fueled. There's a lot, uh, if you're in the software space, there's a lot around SaaS um, out there. So not including something like biotech, say, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they really look at uh, what's your retention rate and churn rate? What's the recurring revenue, the renewals, things like that. Um, and that really dictates how many funds you're going to get interested in uh, the deal. There's also um, a bit of an aversion to risk 
uh, every every round would love to have as much de-risked as possible, sure. obviously, right? Um, when you get to that level, though, bigger dollars, um, they really need much bigger hits, right? A seed round, if you never do another round, you can sell for 30, 50 million bucks and everybody's happy, right? Um, when you get to a round where you're raising 30 million bucks, right, those economics don't work, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, one or two go back to, again, the macroeconomic or today there's macroeconomic headwinds, there's geopolitical instability headwinds, um, there's privacy issues between Cambridge Analytica, GDPR, the California Act. You have to have really good answers that offset that risk. Answers meaning not just explanations, but opportunity, I should say, right? The opportunity has to be so much bigger mm -hmm. than the level of those risks, yeah. um, especially at a Series C. And, uh, you know, three to five years ago, uh, certainly 10 years ago, Series C was just another let's do a quick big venture round and, and hopefully this thing will really take off, right? Yeah. And are you able to share any any metrics of kind of what your I don't know if you can talk about revenue or number of customers or brands or or mailing sent out or anything like that just to give some context to to what it takes to raise thirty one million? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you want you want as good of the metrics as possible. So um, I, I would say some broadly broad ones. Um, you want to see burn kind of leveled out and at an acceptable rate from the growth that you're showing. Um, it, it, that's one of the risks that a Series C generally doesn't want to take. They don't want to be fueling bigger and bigger burn going forward. That should have been taken care of. Does that uh, mean you're, you're, you show profit or you're just showing burn that's not growing as fast as revenue? What does that mean? Yes, uh, so burn should actually be flat uh, month over month, quarter over quarter, and be heading down. Um, preferably for a lot of the firms mm -hmm. uh, that re the amount your deal cycle how quickly you can get customers signed up what the renewal rate is do they go always on or is it SaaS where it's completely recurring what are those are really critical it is it is much more a uh, today um, put the metrics into the you know the formulas and they spit out all the answers and all the charts and, you know, if there's a thousand deals, 2000 deals they can look at every year, I don't know. Yeah, you know, maybe that's a little high for series C, um, probably is very high actually, but whatever number of deals they can see, why choose one with way worse metrics, even if there's a big opportunity, then when you can choose one with really good metrics, yeah. that's also a really big opportunity. Um, so that's really kind of what you're up against as opposed to, Go all the way back to a seed round where a lot of the, a lot of your constituents jump on a founder suite, right? Seed and A. Um, that's that's much less of an issue then because you just got to get the idea off the ground, prove the product market fit, prove the quote unquote dogs will eat the dog food, and um, and that you can keep them happy, right? It's a very different uh, mindset at that point. Yeah, with the the later. Thanks for the founder suite plug, by the way. Uh, but with the later round do you hire an investment banker or is it you and your cfo kind of running the show i'd sound you know i would assume it's heavy on the cfo side of things or, or what yeah well uh we were fortunate um at uh uh we hired on so we debated uh exactly that myself and our cfo marita or hiring a banker to try and do it ourselves with all we had going on and trying to build into our V2 platform um, would have been extraordinarily taxing. Um, any round is already, but when you're up to, you know, whatever, 80 or 100 employees and you got a lot building up, right, you, which is a typical size for a Series C, by the way, um, you know, you, you, you really have to watch where time is best spent versus resources. So um, we had an opportunity where a colleague and friend, uh, Frank Barbieri, who I'd known for about 10 years, um, was at Yumi, and they were just negotiating a merger of equals um, with Rhythm One as a, uh, two public entities, I believe. And uh, 
Frank was um, not sure he wanted to stay and where it was going. He had invested in our seed round. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually an entrepreneur who had pitched me or our fund for Transpera, uh, and we didn't invest in it. Um, and he invested in Pebble Post. And then, so long story short, he joined as our head of Corp Dev. So we got a, a guy, he was running Corp Dev at Yumi, he had also run their product and engineering group worldwide, which was 300 people. He had founded a startup. He had been around the space for quite a while. So we had somebody who'd been through fundraising, been a founder and CEO, um, successfully sold a company, then took that company public, heading it, uh, heading the IPO as head of Corp Dev. So it was a whole bunch of things right at the right time, right place. So we opted to um, bring Frank on to help run it. And, uh, and it really was the right mix for us. The more you can invest in things internally, there's also a notion out there that uh, investing in an investment banker to help you raise at a certainly series B or below is a negative sign um, to a lot of the funds. Um, series C, maybe uh, there were a lot who said um, they prefer that the company is strong enough that it can do it on its own, okay. right? It's not that it's a dig against bankers. It's more if the company isn't in a really good shape to be able to do this, um, why not? And if the reason is we don't have a lot of senior management and we're very taxed on time and effort, that's a good reason. And a lot of funds are fine with it. If it's things aren't going well and we need help to just try and find investors, that's not good, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. I want to touch on your previous life. So you were a VC for what, 15 years or something like that? And I don't think we've mentioned it with Metamorphic. Um, is that about right? 15 years? Plus 10. Minus? 10? 10. Yep. Um, you know, what I, know the, I know the white beard throws you off right now. <laughs> Yeah. How's it it been that like one? you're 29. I don't know how this math <laughs> adds up. Um, you know, what are some, what's kind of the most surprising thing about going back to the, the founder role after being in VC and do you miss VC uh, at all? The, the perception from founders is that VCs have this perfect, easy, charmed life, you know, and we're here in the trenches eating ramen and, you know, VCs are at the Ritz, uh, but I don't know, maybe contrast and compare your two lives. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, somebody recently asked, I was on a, a, doing a talk about this, and I, I thought about it, and it, look, everybody's a pinata in this game. That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. um, candy is the, the, the metaphor here for liquidity, right? So um, LPs whack the GPs at funds, right? We gave you money, make me money, where's my liquidity? Um, the GPs in a fund, right? The, the guys, people who work there are the founders. They'll whack the other partners and associates at the fund. Those people, they whack the founders every day. The founders basically kind of whack all the, the staff every day. We got to get this done. The staff, everybody goes home and they have a spouse who says, where's my liquidity out of these stock options? When is this going to be worse? Everybody's a pinata, right? And, and the problem is you never, just like a kid's party, you never know really when it's going to break and yield the candy. Um, and sometimes they really don't. And like, you know, somebody has to take it down and pull it apart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, I, I've come to realize it, it's all just a cascade there. Um, and, and the truth is, some, you know, you look at what's it like being on both sides of the table. Um, everybody has the same uh, motivations and stresses and pressures. As a founder, what I like is you, you can make decisions and make change happen very quickly. Um, and you know pretty quickly if you're right or wrong. One of the things on the VC side, you, yeah, you raise a fund, you have to deploy it. You have to take the best of whatever deals. In the average fund, it's 20 to 30 deals per fund. You have to take whatever the best deals are over two to three years after you raise that fund to deploy it, right? Um, you, you kind of force this uh, urgency of deployment. So you try and make the best decisions based on where you are, but then you have no idea if you're right for five or even 10 years sometimes, right? Um, and you can't really make a lot of changes. You can remove founders, um, but you're not as a VC. You should never be telling the management team what they should do. 
you're not in charge of operations or execution. When, when VCs tend to meddle in operations, things go horribly awry because they don't, they can't know all the other implications of a decision. Um, so that part frustrated me on the VC side. Um, I would spend a lot of time with my founders. So I have, uh, I can't remember the number right now. I think it's uh, 14 uh, founders and or CEOs from my portfolio are now investors in Pebble Post. Um, four founders I passed on but helped them are also investors in Pebble Post. Mm. Um, and Frank is now the first one of those who's an employee too. Um, heading corp dev and, and product marketing, marketing, et cetera. So, um, I, you know, I tried to build a relationship where I got the best of both worlds, helping them with operations, understanding the downstream effects of the decisions, um, and, and really helping the entrepreneur think it through, work it through and make the decisions that would be best. Um, it, I, I enjoy being back operating side much more, um, yeah. because you, you get to do that every day, right? What, what do you miss about the venture world? Anything? Uh, hearing all the different uh, visions every day. Having somebody come in with the vision to see something that doesn't exist, um, the enthusiasm to will it into being, and the courage to fail in front of everybody trying it, that's really cool. And I, I swore off when I started this, no angel investing, no even real advisorships, because... Um, I didn't want to get distracted um, and I certainly couldn't afford the time, but that's probably the one thing I miss. What did, did metamorphic dissolve or how do you, how do you even switch out of being a VC? What was the conclusion? Uh, you run for the door. <laughs> no kidding. You, uh, we were a three person partnership. I'd founded it, added my first partner, David, and then second partner, Mark. Um, and we were together for, I, guess I think five years six years of it something like that all of us maybe more it was total of 10 for me from the start uh, and uh, we had three different lenses and viewpoints and around what we wanted for investment style what we wanted for management style um, a number of things and they were very complementary when we first started all together and a different expertise at the table um, over time as can happen they started to um, go in different directions. So I really wanted to go back to the operating side. Mark and David each had a different view of what they wanted to do. Um, so I left and they changed the name to Compound Ventures, okay. uh, which is still going today. David uh, is the sole remaining partner that manages it. Mark wound up leaving to go start his own new fund as well. Okay. Um, so that's, it's pretty typical either, um, you know, the, the remaining partners will carry it on themselves or they agree like, you know, somebody else is going to leave and go do what they want to do. Um, but it was all amicable and everything's been going well uh, for them on their, their subsequent investments as far as I know. Very good. One or two more questions. I know you're a busy guy. I appreciate the time. Um, what, if anything, from your, your VC experience did you bring to your fundraising? I mean, did you have any, uh, you know, little techniques you picked up along the way that sort of helped you obviously had the relationships from deals you did, but any other just mindsets, techniques, tactics, anything uh, that applies. Yeah, I think um, so probably the first thing, and, and you mentioned this before being memorable um, coming in at the start and it, it depends on your level of experience and how long you've been in the game, but coming out with something that, commands attention and is extremely memorable. Um, I also very much believe uh, rehearsing a soundbite that is much smaller than an elevator pitch. Mm. And what's your soundbite that somebody can repeat that makes somebody say, huh, like, I'm not sure what that means, but it could be big, right? Um, and that's where I had the seven syllable pitch for a billion dollar opportunity. We invented programmatic direct mail, and then I had my standard elevator script, right? That would be like 20 seconds to tell them what it does. Um, I feel like showing up in a room, having a pitch deck for most entrepreneurs is probably mandatory, um, and you should do it. But I feel like they should be very much about visuals to enhance the story, not scripts and words of yeah. things. Um, 
And a lot of people will tell you that, but I, I can tell you from seeing thousands of them from 10 years on the VC side, and I wish I could remember the companies and the entrepreneurs, night and day, the call it 5% or less, who would show up and have just amazing visuals, not charts and graphs as much as things that communicated and enhanced whatever the point of that part of the discussion was. Um, and it really would resonate so much more. Communicating like a brand. What's the feeling? What's the emotion? What's the um, psychology I want your head in to yeah. understand what I'm trying to pitch you on, sell you on, educate you on, whatever it is. Um, I, I found those extremely helpful um, for them. I think also rehearsing entrepreneurs that had a script rehearsed and they try to always be sure to steer you back into it. Um, and I do this and I really liked it when the other entrepreneurs were. People will ask the same questions after you've, after you've done like four to six pitches. There's almost very little new you're going to hear, right? Yep. Um, so incorporate those questions as part of your script to move them through, build up the story, get them to a highlight. They'll ask a question. You drop down into the standard answer and then you turn them back in maybe with a little bit of a joke back up to the pitch of where it is and then keep them going through the same pitch. Yep. You got to control the conversation. It's a respect thing also for somebody's time. Um, 45, 50 minutes of the meeting, maybe at most of discussion. Pitch should be 20, right? The rest should be discussion. Um, these people want to get back to their job of the fielding their emails or dealing with other companies. A big part of their job is hearing pitches, but you're only one part of it. Um, and entrepreneurs that rambled too far all over the map, didn't have things rehearsed, um, lost control of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, I, even if it's an advisor, investor, or partner in the room, if they're asking questions that distract the person, it's the entrepreneur's job to stop them and get them back to where they want to be. And that really helps a lot. Um, and then I, I think really the, the follow-ups around, you know, like I'll, I'll just tell you that the one way you know for sure for your entrepreneurs um, when there's a pass coming, if they say good luck at the end of the meeting, that means you're, you're dead meat. You have okay. zero interest to follow up. Good luck is the kiss of death. Um, yeah. You know, you want them saying, this is like amazing. How can we meet again? When can we meet? Like, uh, um, and really helping direct them on things to do for their diligence. If they have portfolio companies that can be helpful, if they have investors or advisors of the fund, I would always use it as a business development exercise when I was raising money. And I really respected it when entrepreneurs would do that. Oh, I see you're an XYZ company or you have this advisor or investor on your website. Um, can you please make an intro? Help them. That person's going to give them feedback, right? Help them to do their diligence and get value out of every uh, pitch that you do for yourself. Most VCs really respect that too. Would you, would you say, I see you invested in so-and-so can I get an intro to them as a prospective Pebble Post customer is that kind of the yes uh -huh. yes yeah, so sales or business development um, or if somebody was just a kind of a leader in the space that you're in saying I would love to talk to them and get their perspective on what we're doing um, the truth is you know a lot of them will want to run it by that person anyway sure right? yeah yeah you uh, one last question do you have any advice one of the hard parts and you touched on this with the kiss of death comment which i thought was good one of the hard parts is all right you've hustled you've got that meeting you've got your script prepared you you crushed the pitch and then it's that after that follow-up period and trying to move things along and nudge them along um, keep them you know the heat on the deal any tips for that sort of post pitch meeting uh black hole that a lot of founders <laughs> fall yeah in? Yeah. Um, that's another reason for the ask on intros to portfolio companies and advisors. That's the best way. Um, and if they don't have them or it doesn't come up, finding them on your own as a vector back to that partner who is in the meeting or associate, depending on the, the level of who you're pitching, um, that's the best way to get the feedback. Um, asking them to make intros or getting 
to people who know them as well. Um, there's always a standard send a summary email. Great to meet you. Here's what we're doing. Something that partner can or person can forward around to the partnership. That's helpful too. Uh, reiterating the leave behind materials of a deck or whatever. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, you really have, it, I really think it's more like you have a week uh, to really make an impact before the next partner meeting. If they want to surface you as an opportunity, you'll be surfaced, then you'll be tracked, then there will be follow-up. If they don't surface you or they just don't have their shit together as a fund to, to know how to do that, you're going to be losing track and you're probably wasting time. Um, surface you meaning, uh, define that? A little bit. So uh, bringing it up to the partnership and oh. the weekly meeting yeah. of here's a deal I'm going to look at. Here's what they do. Um, I think it's interesting is does anybody have an, an enormous, you know, uh, feeling against this for whatever reason, right? That's typically what happens. Yeah. Um, and what you want is them to be going in saying, I love this. We're going to want to do this. I'm digging in. Um, they rarely, you know, lead that strongly, um, but you want to get through that first meeting. And I think that's a good check-in for the entrepreneurs too, is um, after a week asking the person you met with, I'm assuming we got brought up in your partner meeting, um, or did you need another week or two of any materials or any diligence before you bring us up? What's your process? And then helping them actually manage their own process. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's a good a, a good tip um, to be able to do to help move them along. Like, what do you need? What can we get you? What else do you want? Have you gotten a we're interested to move forward yet? And don't be timid about asking them. Um, just go right at it. Be blunt. Do you get aggressive in trying to push them towards a yes or no, or if they're not responding and not kind of surfacing you or, or pushing you along, you take that as a not interested like do you, you know? it's a great question it's a tricky spot like i've i've been on both sides of it where uh i've said i don't think i've ever said it to people i've had a lot of people say it to me when i'm raising money of okay you got a lot of people interested you got to get a term sheet get that first term sheet then everybody wants yeah right like you know if i could tell people when to write a term sheet life would be really easy you know yeah. uh, uh, so I feel for the entrepreneur side with that. Sometimes the, the water's not ready to break at the dam, right? Like, but once it does, it's going to be amazing, right? And it is true that once you get one, basically, even to a verbal, um, you can leverage it to make a lot more hay and move things along more quickly. Uh, setting a deadline is very good to do, right? Don't be, I, I would suggest... Don't be uh, too hard-headed about it at the start of the process. You want to, that's again, always doing investor development. If you've got people warmed up and you've built the relationships and you're getting ready to go, you should know the top five or top 10 prospects who really have interest and want to move this forward through the partnership, right? Yeah. So you should be able to get through that in, I don't know, three weeks, four weeks and be able to say, you know, do, do we have to go out more broadly or do we have this really looking like it's heading somewhere good? Um, as much as you can uh, map out your funnel and your process ahead of time to go through it as quickly as possible, the most condensed period, that is absolutely the best um, path. Having rounds that waffle along because you kind of half started it early or ha you know, weren't sure when to end it other than your burn. Like, yeah. Other than not wanting to miss an opportunity, no investor gives a coot about your runway, right? Only if they want, they're afraid they're going to miss it. If they're afraid they're going to miss it, they're going to do it long before you got there. Entrepreneurs oftentimes think their runway dictates the time frame. Not true. Yeah. Yeah. Can you set a deadline if you don't have a, a verbal yet or a lead or, or at least a term sheet or anything? Um, yes. Once you're building up enough to interest and you have, I, I would say, uh, it's, it's suicide to do it before you know you have a likely yes. Mm. Um, all you're doing is forcing the nose to then say, we've got a busted round. Yeah. Um, if you think you've got at least one good yes and at least one or two probable yeses, then saying, uh, you know, we're reviewing with our board and it's uh, a week from Friday, 
we're hoping to have, you know, final indications of interest so that we can select who we move to for a term sheet. Um, being able to, to use that as just a tool of every, look, nobody wants to just keep spending time aimlessly. Um, the investors don't, investor prospects don't either. Um, so that, but, but you have to know that you have a yes in your, your hand of cards. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I could probably pepper you with a dozen more questions on this, the same vein, <laughs> but um, anything else that comes to mind or anything else we haven't covered that uh, advice you'd like to share for people following in your wake? Um, yeah, probably the two biggest things um, for most entrepreneurs you know people say choose your investors carefully you're building a relationship it's a marriage it's for the long haul it's a marathon not a sprint you know blah 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 how many different blog posts about those have people repurpose um, the truth is most entrepreneurs don't get to pick um, who the one investor is who's the lead they have to go with whoever winds up leading right yeah, sure um, the things you can do to help build and protect the relationship number one is communication um, be proactive, uh, invest. This is a line my dad used to give me. He did investor relations for many years. Um, investors love good news and they can handle bad news. They will not tolerate surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, give them advance notice on everything good, bad, and different. I know for a lot, they like early on, you want to do a monthly update email as a standard format covering a couple of the key areas. You know, when you get a little bigger, you could do it quarterly. When you get a little bigger, you can pretty much stop doing it because you're only talking to the, the new leads regularly um, or the people on your board. Um, but really giving visibility and transparency to build trust, right? Even good news. If it's a surprise, they're not, you're not happy. Uh, I remember an entrepreneur who surprised us that he had a multi-million dollar deal close. We, he was running out of runway. We were debating a bridge. We're all stressed out, rallying up our partnerships. And he didn't tell us it was there because he, he thought it would be a good surprise. Mm. It's like we're acting on decisions without that information, even if it's sure. good news, right? Um, we're spending political capital in the fund. We're pushing people to their edge of what we need, things like that, because we didn't know. Um, yeah, that, it, so around that, like choose who you want, but it, it, getting the communication right is critical. Awesome. Lewis, this is great. Um, if people want to learn more, it's simply pebblepost.com, correct? Yes. And I have my blog at startupthemusical.com as well. <laughs> I, get your, <laughs> I get your emails. Uh, they're fun. Anything you want to plug or promote or open job recs or should people just check it out and, you know. Yeah. Check it out. If you're a brand who wants to test us, we're, we're really innovative and proactive about trying lots of um, things that we know work with, with different brands as we're, we're branching out. But um, yeah, we're having fun. Uh, anytime somebody wants to ping me, feel free. Very good. All right. Well, I wish you continued success and I still owe you that motorcycle ride. I know you're a busy uh, guy, but when you're out here next, let's go out on a ride out to Stinson or Bolinas or something. I love it. We are long overdue, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Over and out. Thank you. Take care.